Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be talking with something about something that I think you will have inherited an appreciation for, retained an appreciation for, from previous courses, from 370 and 270. I hope. But um, not all hopes are realized, so I want to make sure that this is something that you're strong on, okay? Um, so we'll use the balance of the time to talk about a very important issue, that sometimes good programs go bad. Sometimes things don't cooperate with your program. What things might go bad for your program? Why might things, a good program, pretty well written, encounter things that are unexpectedly going wrong? Things don't work, seem to work. Give me, give me at least a few reasons for that. A new feature is added and it doesn't cooperate with the, with the rest of the code base. Okay, good. So there's a new feature and it's not, it's, it's written in a mature way, but it's not, it, it doesn't cooperate properly with the rest of the code base. And that would be something an integration um, type of test might test, you know, might reveal. Is A is written well, B is written reasonably, I should say. B is written reasonably, but they don't play well together, okay? Um, okay, another reason? When you're trying to optimize a function, you've removed a variable of some sort that's needed. That's great. So Austin, Austin alludes, whether um, consciously or not, to an old comment um, that optimization is the art of logical brinksmanship. And what that means is that often with optimization, you're trying to find the absolute minimal, the least burdensome way to achieve something. It means stripping out unnecessary redundancy, unnecessary sort of extra logic and care to get to the bare minimum you have to do. And shaving away that fat can sometimes be shaved, lead to shaving a bit too deep. <laughs> and you end up breaking something. You forget about an awkward case because you're, you're, you're trying to make it as, as sort of lean as possible. And it becomes cachexic. Mm. Um, becomes just too, uh, it, it's unable to function. Um, Okay, so that's good. I, I like that a lot. So that could, uh, could occur because of refactoring, not just because of new functionality. What's another reason things could go, it could, could be awkward. Things don't seem to work in your program. Operating system is updated and doesn't work. Before. Good, okay. Something about the environment changes, the operating system. This happens quite a bit, actually. It used to happen even more. You know, um, uh, Windows would be updated and and programs would break. In fact, I, I know from experience that uh, within Microsoft there is an old joke, Windows ain't done until Lotus won't run, um, meaning that they would update the operating system and sometimes kind of hope that their competitor software breaks. That's not playing nice. It would have caught the interest of the antitrust commission in the US. But um, it's, it's true that there was a lot of breaking going on. What other, what other reasons could something break? Or could something not work as, you know, you, you run your code and it, it ends up not working. You, 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 you find that this, this file can't be opened or this thing can't be inserted in the database or whatever. Like admin? Okay, like permissions issues or something like that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's somehow configured improperly. That would be sort of a configuration error. Maybe the build master hasn't configured permissions for the database correctly, despite his hard and, and, and much appreciated efforts. Um, okay, um, that's good. Uh, can logical errors ever occur on the part of a programmer? You bet. What other things are there in the world that are sometimes awkward to deal with? Uh, users? <laughs> yeah. yeah, users. Could a user ever cause a problem with things not working as expected? Users are the yeah. best at causing problems. <laughs> yeah, they're the best at causing problems. So, so absolutely, user, users can trigger 
unexpected things in code, things that aren't fully expected. And look, as mature developers, we have to be able to handle things that go wrong. We don't have the option of just saying, what the hell, you know, you know, it'll blow up if the user enters enters a file that's not there, or you know, enters a name that has an apostrophe in it, or something like that. Or you know, if they they don't have a last name, all they have is one name, and they enter that. I've known several people in my life who have one name, and um, uh, one guy was here at the U of S. You know, the NSID is like for each of the three names. His name. He only had a name with I in it. He's a professor actually in Dropmo. And so it put XX for the other two. <laughs> it's missing. Um, anyway, the point is that sometimes things, users don't agree with things. They use the system in ways that they aren't supposed to, but we have to handle it. We have to handle it in a way that doesn't just, you know, uh, lead to um, it crashing, but something some behavior that doesn't destroy data it's it's meaningful maybe it warns them etc helps them correct it okay this is part of being a mature programmer it's like growing up uh, in software development is we can't just like punt on these things that are inconvenient we actually have to deal with them because users need to be satisfied for us to be paid often okay okay bad things happen as software engineers, we're kind of taught in many classes to think about what the normal case is, the typical case. So we derive algorithms for you know how to achieve this when, when things go wrong. But in general, we tend to have a lot of extra stuff in our code um, to handle cases that aren't convenient. Just like buildings have quite a few things around fire escapes and signs and so on to handle the occasional awkward things, sprinklers. So the sprinkler in here, but they're probably out there. Um, uh, security cameras, all sorts of stuff like that. Okay, um, we have to handle inconvenient cases. It's an inconvenient truth. Okay. Um, now there's three types of problem handling approaches I want to talk about for handling inconvenient things, and they're quite different in their uses when we use them, their level of support from the operating system, their performance implications, and their clarity of dealing with them. And I'm gonna talk about return codes, and that will include some monadic codes, some monadic codes. Remember, you, you folks learned about maybe, I guess, maybe or option, was it called option or maybe in 340? It's for Haskell. For Haskell, maybe, maybe? Yeah. okay. Yeah, Scala has option on, which is uh, very popular and um, Scala is a, a really uh, amazing language for, um, for the uh, Java virtual machine. Um, and we're gonna talk about each of these. The first I wanna talk about is, is return code. So return codes are basically used for times that things are not as expected, but in a way that's pretty common. So you have things like end of files, the last lot, uh, item in a linked list, a, a dictionary is empty or, or what have you, a, an item is not found in a data structure. We, we indicate that by returning a special value. What sort of special values you, might you return in, in Java, say? Um, slash n. Okay, yeah, yeah, for if it's a, uh, potentially if it's a, if it's a character or a string, maybe you could do something like that. What other ways are there of indicating a special value? Maybe what's returned is normally a reference to some, um, to some, you know, person object, but you want to indicate no person was found. What, what, what might you indicate return? Dollar, dollar signs it does? Uh, no. No. Oh. You return, yeah, you, you, when you, Get it? It's a reference to a person object, and when you don't have one, you return null. I thought you meant like the, the naming of the object. Oh, no, no. In this case, it's just, yeah, the reference. I can understand how you off base. So, um, uh, so you know, there's, there's some advantages to this, right? It's lightweight. It's simple. There's some disadvantages, though. Um, 
there's nothing that forces you to handle it. Why is it a big deal? Nothing's forcing you to handle it. What could go wrong? So suppose you have a you know, find method and it can return a reference to a person or it can return a null. What could go wrong with the when how that's used? If you don't have a check. Yeah, if you don't have a check. If you, if you don't check for a null and you're looking in a list, for example, yeah. or you're looking for a person and you don't have that person, that can pretty much break the entire system. That's exactly right. And this is one of the big problems with null. Null has been called, so the person who invented null, okay, there's a person who invented null and he's still alive. <laughs> it shows you, I, I know there's an old joke programmers have when I was young that, you know, the reason the the Roman Empire crashed was because it, it, you know, there was a null pointer that came about. <laughs> they invented the null pointer, but that's not true. Null actually came about in I think the 70s or late 60s. And the person who created it argues it was a billion dollar mistake. It's probably underestimating. It's probably like a hundred billion dollars or something by this point. One of the, uh, there's, there's a history of bad things that have happened because of crashes due to null not being handled. Because the key point is there's nothing that forces you to handle it maturely. There's nothing that says, this can return null. And the compiler says, you got to check it. You know, you're not handling it. And so bad things can happen. Bad things even with a capital B. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you, know, it, you can have uh, inconsistencies. You can have, uh, it's, it's not clear what null refers refers to always, sometimes it can be used to refer to something that sort of not, not applicable. Um, sometimes it can refer to the default person or what have you, so the interpretation um, is not clear. There's no metadata captured about, about the problem if, if something came out. Maybe, for example, I tried to access the database open a database connection and read something and you get back a null. What, what does that mean? Does it mean it couldn't connect to the database? Or does it mean it connected, read, and there was no one by that name in the database? It's kind of opaque, okay? Um, so um, the problem with this is, you know, there's, um, um, there's a lack of enforced type save. There's nothing that forces you to take advantage. It turns out it's also really bad for higher order functions. What do I mean by higher order function? Anyone? A function that takes another function as an argument? How many people here took 340? Okay, okay. So a higher order function is a function that takes another function or closure, if I said closure, does that ring a bell? Or a function that returns a function or does both, okay? And it turns out that these are extremely useful for undertaking functionality, but if you have if I said map, do you know what, do you remember what that is? You map something over a list or something. And if, if somewhere in the mapping it returns null in there, how you handle it will be different in different cases sometimes. And it turns out to be hard to, to have a general way of handling it because it's, it's so sort of specific. Um, and it's hard to use with type parameterized code. What do we mean by type parameterized code? Give me a, a type of object in Java that's type parameterized. A list? Yeah, it's a list of x, right, or of t. It could be a list of ints, it could be a list of doubles, it could be a list of persons. That's type parameterized. And it turns out some things, so what's different about null if you have, why do I say it's difficult to have null if it could be a list of person and a list of lowercase i int. Because guess what? A person is an object. Yeah. And an object has a reference, doesn't it? Yes. Or and it and the reference could be null. No. But does an int have a null? A lowercase int? No. No. It's a it's a value. Type. It's a yes, yeah, it's a primitive value. It's not a reference. So if you have type parameterized code, you can't always say there's, there is a null. I'm gonna return, if I'm looking up in a list of person, I'm gonna return null. If I'm looking at the list of int, I'm gonna return null, no, it doesn't work. There ain't no null there. 
That may be the first time in history of the world that's been said. Mm. Um, okay, so um, you have to be careful about using return values. In, in some classes, you'll see return value used a lot. In, for example, 332. Return values are used a lot, zero or, or minus one and so on. The problem is that often these don't really connote things and they don't force you to handle them, as, as I've referred to. So in and languages like Java or C++ and so on, you can use enums instead. Basically, it clearly delineates the possible values. It gives an interpretation for what's meant by a nice name, for example. And the compiler can check to make sure you've handled all of them, like in a switch statement. Right? You haven't missed one of them. Um, you know, in, in C, typically you'd pound define, you know, things like capital OK to be, you know, zero or minus one. And then you return, you just use the term OK in your code instead of using minus one in your code because it's, it's less uh, clear if you just use the number, right? And in general, you should try to explicitly handle all values. The point is the language is not helping you here. The language has no extra support typically, and so you're on your own. Now, um, the truth is in languages that are more advanced, languages that support monads, we have a very nice way of getting these advantages in a safe, compiler safe way. Maybe is a good example of it. There's many others uh, besides this uh, in these languages. Um, these so-called monads, um, stream could be another, either can be another. These monads are basically um, ways of wrapping up metadata with values. So maybe wraps up metadata, is there a value or not, together with if there is a value. So you could say, maybe it's an int, but and as part of that, it might not be a value in this case. There's no int here, okay? I won't get into that because this class is not 340, okay? But for those who have taken 340, you should know with monads, things like maybe either or an option, streams, etc. There's great ways of dealing with return values without the risks that they're traditionally associated. The compiler can help you enforce checking of them. The next thing I want to talk about is one you should be very familiar with from Java. Exceptions. What are exceptions used for? To catch exceptional cases? Yeah, that are rare and unexpected. So let me ask this. Exceptional case. Is encountering an end of file an exceptional case? That's a long file and you reach the end of the file. Should you use an exception to handle it? No. no. Why not? It's a pretty common case. Because it's supposed to happen every time. It, it, it will reliably happen. Exceptions are used for rail, and, and truly exceptional, they're, they're not standard cases. They're things that shouldn't happen, but we can't rule out. And typically they're not the result of programmer error, it's rather a result of, of something unexpected is, has happened, truly unexpected, not just uncommon. Do you see what I mean? It's not just uncommon, it's, 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 it's unexpected. Um, but it can happen. So um, I've listed a bunch of cases here, right? A data, um, a connection has been lost with the server. Could that happen? Yeah, it can happen. And in fact, to be mature programmers, we have to handle it because we live in an ugly world. Sometimes connections are interrupted. Sometimes memory is exhausted. We don't have more memory. Sometimes the disk is full. Sometimes a uh, file on disk is corrupted. We got to handle it. You, get, you have to handle it. It's, it's uncommon. It's exceptional. We don't expect it to happen, unlike eventually we get to an end of, end of file error or an end of, uh, yeah, end of the file type of situation. But we have to handle it. So 
Here things go wrong in the execution of code. It, it can happen and we want a way to signal that something has gone wrong. Now, one of the challenges, well, we'll talk about challenges with exceptions. So here, I think all of you are familiar with it, right? You throw an exception, it stops the processing of the code. It goes back, where does it go back to? Whither does it go to when you throw it? It tries to be caught somehow. Yeah, it tries to be caught by some sort of dynamically enclosing try-catch. By dynamically, I mean it matters the path you've gotten here. If, there's, if you're inside a try somewhere, either in this method or could it go up a method? Could it go up to the caller of this method? Mm -hmm. Yes. It could go up to the caller of that. The caller's got however high it has to go to get to a what? Try catch. Try catch, yeah. You're, you're inside a try and it, it gets caught by a catch statement. Right? So if I have a try and there's an associated catch for a, you know, exception, all exceptions, or maybe it's a runtime exception, or maybe I catch, you know, a file not found exception or whatever. If that try associated with that catch, if that try is a call in it to another function which encounters a file not found exception, it may propagate up to be caught here, right? So it unrolls the stack. It unrolls it, boom, 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 boom. Depends whether you think of it as going down or up. Um, but it, when it's really good, it makes that sound, boom, 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 boom. And then it then it hits the catch, and it catches it, right? Okay. Um, so it defines, it goes back in the call stack, right? Um, to signal these conditions, Java uses exceptions. Um, and you know they're thrown in, in 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 caught right so we have this sort of thing right we can have catches for different exception types what does a finally statement do finally was i think it occurred first in c sharp have you folks done programming c sharp a little bit okay uh, it was first in c sharp and then it got copied by java just like c sharp copied some java things java's copied some c sharp things what does finally do Exactly. Whether it's it or not, either after the regular try, you do finally, or after any exceptional condition, you do finally. So this is like common things. Maybe you're closing database connections or whatever. That have to be closed in either case. So the key point is, even if the try call block calls another function, that calls another function, that calls another function, that calls another function, and then it signals uh, an exception. If there's nothing in that process that constructs exception handlers for that thing, it'll propagate up to here. Right? It'll roll back the stack however long it needs to get to an exception handler. Okay? Um, okay. Drawbacks of exceptions. There are a number of drawbacks of exceptions. I don't know if people have talked with you about these things. One of the main ones for practical programming is it ain't cheap. It's expensive. I mean darn expensive. In some cases I've heard of, you can have exceptions that slow down the performance of a program by a factor of 10, if they're occurring on a regular basis. They consume a lot of effort. Why do they consume so much effort? How does it consume so much in the way of processing time? I'm guessing because it has to keep holding the exception while it moves through the code. Yes, it has to, so that's a way to think of it. it when you enter a try, statement associated with, with uh, together with associated um, ex, um, catch blocks, it needs to actually put together some information on that to know where to stop going when it rolls back the stack. Yeah, it adds an extra layer. Kind of yeah, it adds extra layer of all this stuff that it has to actually build these data structures. And each time you enter into one of those, it's doing that, and each time you throw an exception, it has to roll back this stack, leave specially, leave specially, leave specially, go back to there, and then sometimes try again. And if you're doing this a lot, it's very expensive. Another issue that you have is, and I'm going to say memory leaks, and I'm going to say 
most languages, what do you have? Some, some, some languages you have memory leaks. Give me, a, give me a, a language where you might have memory leaks from exceptions. C++. C++. Big time. Big time. Because in C++, in contrast to Java, what do you have to do in C++ that's yeah. automatically handled in Java? What in Java do you have automatically? Pointers. Well, we have pointers in C++. <coughs> Isn't it memory allocation? In fact, in fact, we have references in Java, which are functionally like pointers. But yes, it's memory allocation. What do you have to clean up memory in Java? You have a garbage collector. And it automatically goes and cleans up memory. Now, it turns out it's, it's hard. It's a hard job. It, there's these things where A points to B and B points to A, and it's, um, it's interesting. But basically, in Java, the memory leak issue is not a big one. C++, it is a big one. Why? What do we have to do in C++ we don't have to do in Java? Yeah, we, we do that a lot. And, and in general, we explicitly allocate and explicitly do what? Deallocate. Yeah, we, we delete, right? In there. It doesn't clean up after us. It expects us to manipulate these things. Now, that can be sometimes, you can use that for some performance benefits. But it also invites a heck of a lot of bugs. bugs. Heck of a lot of bugs. It really re raises the chance of memory problem, memory leaks or dangling references. You think it points to something, and it really doesn't. So, but in most languages, not just Java, what can happen? Think about it. Suppose you have files open. Suppose you have database connections made. What what could go wrong? What does Java not automatically do? It frees up memory, sure that we've allocated, but what does it not do? It, it gives a, it points to a, a false reference. Well, it's not so much th th that. Um, having trouble operationalizing a case where that's going on, um, that would be a common thing. Um, there's some we weird cases I can imagine something happening, but, but what are the things what other things do we sometimes need to do when we're done with something? Think about database connections. Think about file file handles. Close files. Yeah, we have to close files. We have to close connections. We have to complete certain types of things, transactions or what have you. And there there ain't no garbage collector that's going to know exactly how to, you know, finish up with this file or something like that. So sometimes we can have resource, oh, oh my gosh, okay. Um, resource um, closure issues um, where we wanna handle this nicely and, um, and it's not. And so there's no guarantee that we're gonna close it nicely. <laughs> we have to put in that logic in exceptions. Now, please, I beg of you. When I say you should put in exceptions, <laughs> please don't just have it print the stack and bomb out of there. I don't know how many student exceptions I said. They said, oh, yeah, I'm using exceptions. Great. And I go and look at it. And it's like print stack trace, <laughs> bomb out. It's really not that meaningful except to give you a bit of debugging information. It's better than nothing. At least you have something. But you should really clean up after yourself. And that means, that means closing resources, handling things responsibly, giving the user a message maybe. Something went wrong. Maybe tr please try again later <laughs> if it's something like network is congested. Maybe it's, please enter a different file name. Give them something to know what to go with. You don't want them, users are pretty impatient. I'll tell you a lesson, having run small companies and producing software for folks, people are pretty impatient. People are not computer scientists. And if it ain't working a couple of times, they're gonna not wanna use it. Much less pay for it and use it. So you got to be careful with that. Um, 
Exceptions are also hard to reason about. Why do I say they're hard to reason about? Because basically it can pop down from here. You're going along here and then it can pop out to one of these things and leave some code not executed here. And then sometimes, you know, this catch can lead to some other code down here and it's not clear that Maybe, maybe you had a variable that is computed up here, but it, the exception was hit before it was computed. And then, you know, these, so it was a variable declared up here. You, you didn't have a chance to calculate it yet before the exception was hit. And then you're using that variable down here and it's not yet initialized. So Jay's comment is bang on in that case. It can lead to confusion about that. Um, turns out it also has some problems with, with subtyping. Um, subtyping uh, rules. Um, finally is, is, is a good thing. Garbage collection is a good thing. Um, and handling of checked exceptions is a good thing. Um, one of the issues with encapsulation, this is from a previous version of 470 or 371 that I taught. Um, if you have A calling B and B calling C, suddenly A needs to sometimes know what what C can throw. Because remember, C may throw something, an exception, and it propagates upwards, right? On the call stack, A, A calls B, B calls C. If C throws an exception, if it's not handled by B, where does it go? A. A. And so A needs to know what exceptions can be thrown by C. Even though it doesn't call C, just something it calls, or something that it calls that it calls, or something that it calls that it calls that it calls. Etc. Ad infinitum. And that's an uncomfortable thing. It needs to know about the implementation. What does B need to do its job? What particular things does it call? What exceptions can they throw? Which is breaking this notion of encapsulation, this notion of modularity, this notion of separating interface from implementation. In general, A shouldn't have to change if B changes how it does things, but exceptions are a regrettable exception to that rule. Okay, so A gets tangled with C even though it doesn't call it directly, which is unpleasant because it makes A have to change even if C evolves. Maybe C changes and adds an exception that it can throw. Guess what has to handle it? A. a. But A doesn't have anything to do with C, but it's, it calls B and it so happens B is implemented to UC. And so it gets into specifying within the preconditions, postconditions. One of the postconditions is not just the return value or what it modifies in memory, but what? The postcondition needs to include Exception. exceptions that are thrown. That's the point that students can miss. Return values, things modified like in memory, this updates the global symbol table or this updates the file on disk and exceptions that can be thrown. Okay, so there's some problems with exceptions. High performance costs, lack of referential trans, uh, transparency, uh, uh, difficulty reason about control flow, lack of type safety. Um, sometimes A, A calls B, which calls C, but there's nothing enforcing it to handle C's things, and they can go all the way up and lead to a bad message um, that the user gets. Okay. So what are some exception suggestions for exceptions? Well, one is you're going to want to translate the exception to something meaningful if possible. When I say layer at hand, um, let's suppose that the user is using your program. Something goes wrong with um, error checking in the connection to the database. Or in terms of a file, the file has a checksum or has a code associated with it and it doesn't check. You don't want the user to get a message that says, you know, cyclically, cyclic redundancy check error failed. Or, you know, um, invalid bit in communicating with the server. For them, it's not a meaningful thing. It'll be like, you should have a, 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 an explanation that's meaningful for them at that layer 
And so with the user, it could be something like um, problem with connection to database. Please contact your system administrator with this message or with this error code. Or it could be network congested or network connection unstable. You should try to, or you know, disk full or disk or, or um, file corrupted. You know, file is messed up. Please reinstall or, or you know, um, or, or eliminate file or what have you. So you want to have a, a, a term that's meaningful to avoid alienating the user. Um, connection not available, right? Um, try to handle as soon as possible. What do we mean by as soon as possible? Who would handle it? Here. C throws an exception. Who would handle it when I say as soon as possible? Uh, C if possible. Okay, C would be great if C could handle it. That would make it go from C to shining C. Um, but if C didn't handle it, where should it be handled if possible? B. B. And only last recourse, something further up, A. Among other things, those closer it is, the more context it has about what's going on. Um, which is is good um, uh, for languages which have checked exceptions, which Java does. Don't throw checked exceptions for things that can be sort of reasonably handled. Don't just punt and throw it up to the next higher level. Throw it over the wall. Try to handle it. Um, reuse common exceptions. Don't create your own exception type. If there's a you know, file not found exception, you can use that, or an out of memory exception. Uh, document causes for exceptions. If you throw something, say something about why it's thrown. Don't just say it's a generic exception. Where could this help you, not just users? Where could it help user? Uh, where could it help you? Yeah, you can. It can help you debug it. It can help you test it. If there's a failure, you know well, why it why it failed. You can include relevant contact, who to contact about this, for example. Um, and a final thing, which I won't get into, is aim for atomic operations. Anyone know what an atomic operation is? An operation that is done in that line and not done like with a race condition, like it doesn't do it at the same time. Good. It, you, you have a lot of the key ideas there, Jesse, as normal. That's excellent. You didn't, it, no one here took 355? Okay. So atomicity should be covered in 355. I don't, I, I don't know if it, if it has been. Uh, I think it has been. Um, this is an extraordinarily important concept in today's world at both in terms of dealing with databases, but also when dealing with concurrency more generally. There's a lot of times with computer systems, ladies and gentlemen, that we need things that are going on to coordinate effectively. Um, we, need, we need them to be done as a unit, together or not at all. Let me give you an example. Suppose I were to order a book on Amazon. Hmm? I'm ordering a book on Amazon. What if it were to take my money, but only after that encounter a problem with getting my book ready for shipment, and so it would just bomb out on that. It would encounter an error, and it couldn't complete preparing it for shipment. Do you think I would have reason to, be, to object? Yeah, I'm not getting my book. Do you think if it prepared it for shipment and then didn't charge my account, my, my money, do you think Amazon could have reason to be upset? Yeah, they're not getting paid for their book, for their product. So this example is something where you want both to happen together or not at all. Another example, I wanna go and rename an account, okay? Um, and maybe I do it under the covers by deleting the old one and creating a new one with the new name, with all that same information. Suppose I delete the old one 
and I go to create a new one and it fails. Could that be bad? Yeah, it's deleted this instead of renaming it. Conversely, suppose it first, you might think, well, let's create it first. Suppose I create it first and then I can't delete it. Could that be bad? Yeah, now you have two accounts instead of one. So there's a lot of cases in computing where we need things to happen together or not at all. And they need to happen as a block. And the way in which we say this is we talk about it, it needs to be atomic. It needs to happen together or not at all. It's as if we never tried it, nothing changed, or we completed all of it. And there's this whole area of, of, of computing and concurrent systems and, and systems which are transactional to ensure this. Um, we have two-phase commit protocols, they're called. And it's particularly important when we have distributed systems, and Jesse was alluding to the fact we have multiple things going on at the same time, because if one of them fails, all of them may fail, but the others may not have failed, and we need them to tell them, hey, hold your horses, roll back, because this one failed, you can't go forward. All of them are ready, they've all done their job, they're just waiting for the final one to finish, and it fails. And it's like, oh man, now we need to undo all our things, right? And that's exactly what atomicity helps avoid. You, you aim for something, it, it happens together or not at all, okay? Final thing I wanna talk about. So that was exceptions. And the reason it's helpful with, why is that helpful with exceptions, to have it be atomic? because you don't want it to bomb out in the middle of an operation. It's done half of it. It's in this inconsistent state and never gets around to doing the other half. It's charged you for the book and it hasn't prepared it for shipping. Bad news. Mm -hmm. With a capital B and a capital M. That pun. No objections? Okay. Carrying right or along. Um, let's talk about assertions. What are assertions used for compared to exceptions? Um, sanity checks. They're sanity checks. They're specifically to catch developer mistakes. The goal of an assertion is to fail early, fail often. Alert the programmer, fail early. Alert the programmer to misplaced assumptions as soon as, early, as soon as possible. If something has gone wrong, you want to know about it as soon as possible. You don't want to let it be silent but deadly, spread, you don't know that there's been a failure to write data to the database and you go on computing things um, and working with the user, wasting their time and then it all gets lost. Um, or you know, you, uh, you have this faulty value that comes back from the database and you're doing calculations and presenting results when it's not, when it, when it uh, has been incorrect. You wanna know something's gone wrong as soon as possible. And it turns out assertions document your assumptions. What does it mean to be sane? What does it mean to be, you know, to be, uh, what are my assumptions here that I'm assuming that this is non-null and this thing has at least one value with a key that's non, not empty, et cetera. It reduces the likelihood an error will slip through. It reduces debugging time. Why does it reduce debugging time? Because if you fail early, then you know probably where the bug is. It's much closer often to where the problem is. Whereas if it propagated for a while before it died, maybe that null pointer got stored away and then a bunch of stuff happens more and computing is being done and then later that null pointer comes into use and boom, it blows up five minutes later. Imagine trying to debug that. It's not that fun because a lot of stuff has gone on to cover up the tracks. And it helps improve the thoroughness of test by testing is it is it sane along the way okay I had argued before in an earlier version of 371 and 470 that assertions remember I made this distinction on that very board I squint I might be able to see it between faults and failures what do I mean by a fault versus a failure Okay, good. What's the difference between a fault and a failure? A failure is a 
manifestation of a problem. It's like an error message comes up or the system gives the incorrect value or you know what there's a weird thing on the screen that shouldn't be there or it crashes or it's a sign of a problem the underlying problem we call a fault and peer review as jay noted with alacrity is points to faults we see the fault we see the mistake in our reasoning typically testing finds failures what do assertions find? They often much more find a fault. There's something much closer to a fault. They find a misplaced assumption. You're assuming X and it just ain't so. So there's this notion of offensive program. There's defensive program, but there's an offensive program. You actually try to get the program to quit early. And you can do things like with low-level languages, you you allocate memory with calic or malloc. Malloc. Yeah. Well, calic's also good. And um, uh, but you could basically do things with that you could do with calic. You could do with malloc. Right. But malloc gives you back a chunk of memory. It's not necessarily initialized. Fill it with illegal values. Why would you fill it with illegal values? Doesn't that sound perverse? Why would you fill a chunk of memory values you should never be able to see? Trying to break it. You're, yeah, you're trying to see, is anything referring to an unallocated thing in here? You're gonna fill it up with things that are meaningful and hopefully things will be just referring to the meaningful parts. But if something's referring to a place that you're not actually using, you want it to know about it as soon as possible. And the way to do that is to have it have something of value that's obviously off balance, like negative one or, or null or what have you. Um, you fill it up with illegal data before deletion. Why would you do that? In case later it's called. Yeah. And a server will catch that. Yeah, yeah. So exactly. So if you have a free on an object, just before it's freed, you fill it with some illegal data. And if something is still keeping a what to that, a yeah, reference or pointer to it, and you're and you're manipulating that or you're looking into it because it's illegal contents. You'll spot. Oh, wait a minute, something's crazy here. Whereas if you hadn't filled it in, it would have looked like a normal object. You wouldn't have known that it was deleted. You wouldn't have known that it was deallocated, and you might have gone blithely ahead and just used it. Does that make sense? You would have been blind to this problem. Mm -hmm. um, th there's quite a few other things like, th oh, an another good one is you have an enum, you create as the default value of the num, if, if you don't, if you have an enum variable in Java or C sharp and you don't, or Scala, and you don't actually assign to it, it has a default value, then you make that illegal. So if it hasn't been assigned, you'll spot it. It's this illegal value, okay? So the goal here is fail early, as I, as I said. Now, it's beautiful with assertions what you could do. You could check preconditions, postconditions. You could check invariants. This thing is always greater than zero. This table is never, is never empty. This, this is something which you know, these two things always sum to this value. A is always greater than, or I is always less than J. Or you can test history properties, things that, you know, again, are, are true at different points in time. You know, uh, you measure T1, T2, there's some thing. It only stays the same or rises in value. Critically, you can, you can capture other logical oversights by the programmer. Um, internal inconsistency with an algorithm, for example. And I had mentioned before, you can compare brute force computations against more subtle versions, more optimized versions. You could check the heap is not corrupt in a language like C or C++. Um, make sure that you know a reference passed in is not null, or the results of looking something up are not null. Um, results of new code, so you refactor code. What do I mean by refactor code? I refactor some code. 
key part of, of agile processes. What does it mean I refactor it? You take out a common functionality and like, let's say two, three functions, you just take it out, make it its own function, just keep calling okay. that. Okay, that's an example of refactoring. What's the defining feature of, so, so refactoring involves a changing of code, but what, what distinguishes it from any type of changing of code? Well, you still want it to do the same thing. Yeah, that's the key thing. It doesn't change the functionality. It doesn't change what it does. It changes how it does it in a way that improves quality. And Moult suggested a way of improving quality. Um, that quite appropriate. You, you refactor to capture some functionality in a shared method. So instead of having that functionality repeated thrice, you have three things that call the same underlying function. Excellent. Um, but there's many other things. You can clean up code, you can insert comments, you can put in assertions, you can, you can go and uh, reduce repetition in code by taking common conditions and putting them in a function which has a nice name. Um, that, that communicates their goal. You can, you can simplify some code that you realize it only really has to handle two values, not an arbitrary number, et cetera. Um, in short, refactoring is about keeping the same functionality. What it does is the same. How it does it has improved quality. And, um, and you could take refactored code, take the code before, refactoring the now, and compare it call both of it and make sure it's the same results. Well, why would you do that? Again, I mean, these things are expensive. I mean, after all, the user only wants to run one of those, the better one. So how could we, in an assertion check, or how could we check the brute force algorithm against the efficient one? After all, it's gonna take, it's gonna chew up all the time that we're saving with the efficient algorithm, because now we're doing both. It's gonna take even longer than the brute force algorithm by itself. What's the, What's the key thing that we can take advantage of with assertions? Well, we can turn them on and off. We can turn them on and off. We can turn them off flexibly, okay? Um, uh, hey, come on. Um, here it is. Oh, man. Here it's so partly covered up. We can enable assertions and disable assertions with command line arguments to the JVM. We could say, turn assertions in this module on, turn them off in that module. And we could turn them off across the entire program without even recompiling, without modifying the code. We can keep them on for testing and debugging, not for the user code, okay? Um, so typically these only occur in test and debug code. Um, um, some people, there's a, there's a philosophical debate should you handle exceptional conditions as an error in the final code? If this thing is, do you assume that exceptions will pass in the final code you ship to users or do you handle them? And handling them means giving a mature error message, for example, for them. Or do you just assume by the time it gets to user code, they're not gonna happen? You do want to, in general, so I won't take a stand on that. I'm not going to force you to use it one way or the other. It's just, it's a, there's a, there's a debate, different quarters of the, um, of industry. You are advised to do logging with them. What do I mean by logging here? Well, instead of just throwing and, you know, a nice little box, you might actually write it to a disk or you post it to HTTP or you send an email message or, you, you end up writing it to a database for logging. Um, heck, assertions document your assumption. If you read the assertions, you can kind of read what is the programmer thinking is the case at different times. They're assuming this, they're, they're asserting that. It helps document what you're thinking about how the code works. And that's very, very useful. It helps clue the person reading the code to what is the case here. If it got here after this exception, it must be the case that this thing is not null. Hmm? Or that A is greater than B, or I is greater than J, right have you. The key thing, an absolutely key thing, pop quizzable with delight, 
Do not use assertions to check merely inconvenient things that can happen without logical program error. Okay, logical pro reasoning, uh, program programmer reasoning, i.e., uh, things that can happen without a programmer um, uh, uh, a failure in programmer um, uh, reasoning. These things may be present in user code. So give me something that should not be checking with an with a with an assertion. Integers are greater than zero. Yeah, except if that. Okay, yeah. So that 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 should be the case by definition of the semantics of integers. So that wouldn't be that helpful to check. Disk is full. Probably. Disk is full, out of memory. The connection is down. Why don't Why don't you want to bomb out when that happens? It's basically any exception that you would use because yeah. if, if it happens while the user is using it and you bomb out, you just kind of like destroy everything. That's right. You just you're just punting on something that could do enormous user damage. That should be handled instead with a what? Exception, exception generally, not an assertion. Assertion is like. I believe logically this has to be the case. It's not logically the case that you know you're still connected to the internet, you know, or that the connection is is not is con you know that it's congested or or that it's not congested or what have you. So um, so do not um, do not you know do these sort of things for uh, for a case where, for example, you have no memory. That, that allocator or a file can't be found on disk. A file cannot be found on disk for reasons other than programmer <laughs> reasoning error. It's like something deleted it or something went corrupt with the disk. And you got to be mature and handle those things. It's not it's not a choice to just bomb out. Okay, um, I don't have time to go into this. I give some examples here. Like this is a bad use of an exception. What's what's bad about this? I mean, sorry, an assertion. What's what's bad about this? This is an assertion in C. Logically, strings can be null. Okay. It. Yeah. And where does this string it's come from? Right after allocation. Yeah, after allocation. So, so logically. It's not going to be null. Log well, logically, allocation can return a null value. What does that mean? If it returns, if malloc returns a null value, it just means There's that. You're out of memory. Can out of memory conditions occur logically? Yeah. yeah. Is it inconvenient? Yeah. But we as programmers have to deal with things that are inconvenient. It's part of being a grown up. Is handling these things are inconvenient. Could you throw an exception here? Yes. Throw a nice throw a nice error to the uh, to the user saying you know. Um, um, unfortunately, we do not have enough resources to continue. Um, uh, we will save the program, you know, we will save data to disk at restart, um, you know, after closing other programs. Yes, that would be a good thing. Can you just bomb out and say, you know, th 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 you know things are inconvenient, sorry, see you later. No, lose, lose data. So part of being a grown-up is not doing this. You don't just say, I'm out of here. Okay? So... Return code, exceptions, assertions. Return codes, great for very common things, lightweight, but don't force you to deal with them except in modern languages where you have these monadic ones, things like option. Exceptions, really good for handling truly exceptional conditions aren't expected to happen. Pretty heavyweight, can be confusing. Some There's some basic principles for using them well. Handle it as close as possible to where it's thrown. Translate the messages as you go up, etc. Assertions, use them early, use them very often. I look forward to seeing them in your code to catch reasoning mistakes on the part of the programmer. Either you've made a mistake in your reason about what's possible here, or someone, another programmer who's called your code has has given you something despite it being in violation, say, of the preconditions. Okay?
That is all, ladies and gentlemen, for today. Okay? Now, I need to uh, apologize for today. I need to get on the road to Regina very soon um, to go before it's uh, it gets dark. If any of you need to speak with me right away, um, I'd be glad to do so briefly. Um, but uh, otherwise, I will look forward to seeing you on Thursday. Oh, yes. Um, I'm just going to... Sure. Uh, to tell you that I already requested a Travis and my... Oh, you did? Yeah. I okay. just did this morning. Okay. Yeah. Through me? Yeah. Okay, so you need me to do something for that. Yeah. Good, uh, good. Right. Okay, so let me let me go do that right away here, and uh, glad to be able to help.